Okay, great. Well, welcome to uh, to stream three. So uh, we've got a talk now from uh, Stefano uh, uh, Capaldo, um, who's the uh, the managing director of the apprenticeship scheme at uh, Firebrands, uh, to talk a little bit more about uh, the scheme and how that works. Um, we'll have questions at the end. So if you have got questions, if you put your hand up, and uh, one of the staff will bring uh, the roving mic round, and then hopefully that will get captured on the camera and uh, everybody can hear. But uh, I'll hand over to Stefano now. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so I'm using uh, Prezi, so if anyone has Vertigo, I apologise. Apparently, it uh, kicks that off, apparently. I didn't know that. Uh, so um, I'm going to be talking to you today uh, about the levy and the apprenticeships, taking through the journey of apprenticeships so that you understand how to start the process and effectively how to hire people. And apprenticeships are an amazing way to grow um, your cybersecurity workforce. If you think about some of the consultants here, who have a lot of experience, um, uh, they, they may be doing tasks and administrative functions that ultimately um, a more junior individual could be doing. And, and apprenticeships are effectively a foundation of skills. And cybersecurity is one of the standards available in apprenticeships now. Um, it's an amazing way to grow that foundation base uh, of apprenticeships, uh, of cybersecurity experts within your organization. And, it, it won't take long for you to realize that an apprentice becomes a really valuable um, individual in your workforce. Within six to, to 12 months, they will be, I would say, you know, uh, delivering solutions within your organization as, as any one of their peers that have been working for you for you know, uh, two to three years. So I'm gonna explain why, why apprenticeship, why, why there's been a change, uh, what the levy is, um, who the players are in the marketplace, you know how, how the, there's an interconnectivity between all the uh, parties delivering apprenticeships. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, funding, in particular, the levy, how that affects uh, levy paying um, uh, uh, employers. The payment structure, quite an important um, element to understand when you're working with training providers, or if you um, intend to become a training provider yourself, uh, w w you know, as an employer. Um, some steps and suggestions for how to start for employers, um, best practice for hiring apprentices and keeping them hired, um, and then finally the product, what is an apprenticeship standard in particular for the cybersecurity um, um, areas that we're talking about today. So why, uh, no surprise, we just haven't as an industry as a UK invested in skills and the Previous apprenticeships might have worked for some industries. You know, um, for example, I found out the other day that there's a, a standard for a poultry technician. So, you know, chicken farmers obviously have a great time with apprenticeships. But for the digital industries, it hasn't worked. And apprenticeships, um, especially for the digital world, uh, have been you know have been a bit Mickey Mouse and, and unrespected in the past. They work though. Um, you know, there, there, is, there is a lot of evidence suggesting apprenticeships um, are very successful. The return on investment is high, uh, lower cost of, of acquisition of the workforce. And there's loads of evidence basically to suggest that apprenticeships do work and there's, there's, there's no reason why employers should be, you know, concerned. So employers, as I said, haven't been investing. So the government has finally done something dramatic to uh, change that. There's a hell of a lot of cash available from the government, quite frankly, to promote apprenticeships. Co-funding, the government is um, bringing in 90% uh, uh, funded initiatives with, an, uh, with apprenticeships, and it's forcing the issue of large employers through what is the levy, and I'll, I'll, ex I'll explain that in a minute. There are other benefits of uh, the, the change in apprenticeships. Predominantly, they've become an employer-led system, so employers and many employers that are in this building today have actually contributed to these standards. So the cybersecurity standards, um, Crest uh, themselves, have been part of a panel uh, maybe two years ago putting together the requirements of a skill set that makes an uh, apprenticeship, a, a cybersecurity apprenticeship. So these are apprenticeships that have been driven by employers. They're not academic framework based um, uh, no, um, uh, knowledge uh, bodies that have been created artificially. These are real employers creating re real apprenticeship requirements. 
um, greater value for money. Apprenticeships in the past didn't really have um, a lot of funding um, allocated to them, maybe up to £10,000. Today, apprenticeships have up to £18,000, which means that there's more content available, proper programmes to be able to you know, train individuals with, with a lot more substance and, and, and flexibility. Um, and the final uh, point here is that employers have a lot more control over these uh, apprenticeships. Employers now are in charge as opposed to training providers where they can stop and start the payments to training providers, they can demand flexibility and they don't necessarily have to always uh, pay for the whole standard, the whole apprenticeship. They can be very flexible about taking components of the apprenticeship and I'll explain how that works in a, in a bit more detail in a second. So who's involved in the apprenticeships? Uh, obviously the government, uh, the Department for Education, they're there to create um, the rules around the money, uh, um, who, who can get the money, who can do the training, how does it get drawn down. Um, there's a newly formed Institute of Apprenticeships. They are effectively the governing body of apprenticeships to make sure there's quality there, to make sure everyone's behaving, all the funds and rules are all being, um, um, being adhered to. Ultimately, it's government money, and with government money comes um, lots of rules. Uh, training providers, there are you know, many training providers of, of, of all sorts, but independent colleges, unis, and, and as I said earlier, employers themselves can become training providers for their own staff. Endpoint assessment, the BCS is here. That's an example of an endpoint assessment. These are organisations that are uh, testing the apprentices at the end of their program to make sure they've got the skills that have been driven by the standard. As I said, all employers can take on an apprentice, very small, medium, large. The real only requirement, inverted commas, is that there's a job. Okay, this, is, this is a requirement for any type of money that gets drawn down from government is you, you need to have a job, you need to have a vacancy. When you go to draw down funds from the government, you need to prove that there's a new opportunity, that there's um, a, a new skill, a new, a new vacancy within your organisation. It doesn't ne necessarily need to be newly employed. It can be your own staff that already exists, but it has to be a new opportunity with, with, with effectively a job description. And ultimately, apprentices themselves, traditionally very much heavily biased against school leavers, um, but now graduates can can be put onto programs, um, existing employees, and there's no age gap, uh, cap, sorry. So this is a really powerful change that they've uh, introduced. Graduates now can uh, go onto apprenticeship programs, so even though they may um, leave at a level seven or have done some of, the uh, some of their graduate programs, they can um, repurpose into apprenticeship programs, so your, your STEM um, uh, graduate could, could do a cybersecurity program. Funding, so this is the, the interesting part. Again, for levy payers, 0.5% of the pay bill so um, is, is allocated, is a new tax as of um, this month. Um, so it gets calculated from your payroll and then gets allocated into next month's digital account. I'll explain that in a second. You're only allowed one connected company, so if there's a group of companies, then you have to um, choose the, the payroll effectively that you're drawing down the funds from. Uh, levy payers use their contributions and if they deplete their contributions then they move into the same kind of model as uh, non-levy payers which is the government contributes 90% um, additional funds against the training program. I, I'll show you some worked examples. And non-levy payers are pretty much 90% funded by the government. So if you have a training program, training apprenticeship, 90% is funded by the government. And a couple of additions for the new, uh, for next year. 10% um, of levy funds can be used in your supply chain or given to other employers. Uh, so that's quite powerful. So you can start to you know, support your supply chain in, in 2018. Um, and you know, the government is kind of drinking their own bathwater. 2.3% of public sector workforce have a target to be apprentices in 2018, which is huge. So very briefly, um, you have a, a monthly payment. So this is uh, your payroll. They calculate the amount. They put it into a digital account ready for you 
um, next the month uh, after to use uh, to pay for training. The government tops up 10%, which is very powerful. So again, you know, the government is additionally adding more uh, funds for you to uh, purchase apprenticeship uh, training, um, and then you can start delivering the training with with your chosen provider. So, very simple example: seven million pound payroll. Your levy uh, your levy tax is twenty two thousand pounds. That goes into your digital account. Then you use that in the following month to with your training provider. Non-levy payers, you pay 10% up front of the program. So for an £18,000 cybersecurity program, uh, which is the maximum band, you'd pay £1,800 and the government would put the the rest in to fund your apprenticeship. So it's really powerful, lots of money, loads of incentives. There are even more incentives. Uh, National insurance contributions don't need to be paid up until the age of 25. For 16 to 18 year olds, Um, and um, disadvantaged. Um, There are additional payments, £1,000 to provider and employer to be used however they see fit. For very small businesses, it's a great way for small businesses to grow their cybersecurity uh, practice. 100% of the funds are paid for if you hire someone under the age of uh, uh, 19. So again, really powerful incentives. This is all transacted through, effectively, online a digital account where you can manage your providers and manage your payments. Um, and all very, very simple. A um, couple of key points. Your levy is calculated on the people who are employed in England at the moment. So if 100% of your workforce is in England and 100% is, 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 um, is available, if it's 90% then 90%. But if you, your employees do not live in England, but they work in England, they are eligible for the uh, apprenticeship program. And it can be used for you know, various things, and it can't be used for wages, travel, uh, other expenses that aren't part of an overall list. To deliver an apprenticeship, sorry, to, to go on to an apprenticeship and to be an employer with an appren- apprenticeship, um, you have to how you have to be on the, an authorised training provider list, which is called the, the, the Register of um, Apprenticeship Training Providers. And um, to be assessed on apprenticeships, you have to be, again, part of an authorised assessment body, BCS being one of them. So payments, the, the small point but important one, as an employer, if you choose the, um, a training organisation, they will only receive a small amount of funds every month. So that has a material impact in the negotiations and what you expect out of your training programme. Um, for example, an £18,000 course, the government held, holds back 20%, so that leaves 14400 and then they divide that by the duration of the, the apprenticeship programme. I'm, I'm quoting here 24 months, it could be 16 months. Whatever that number is, that is that that number is the only amount of payment you can give the training organisation. That causes a problem for some training organisations because ultimately, by month three, they may have three thousand pounds worth of costs, um, and you only have um, eighteen hundred pound worth of funds to pay them. So this is where negotiations or um, you know conversations happen with your apprenticeship providers or yourselves as employers. So some steps. Um, Ultimately, you need to understand um, you know, who, who may be interested in apprenticeships. Um, if you're a levy payer, typically your CFO is probably already kind of being uh, twitchy about where to repurpose those funds. Uh, but the procurement uh, department have you know, uh, training organisations they may have on a preferred su- supplier list, uh, IT department heads, your cybersecurity heads, HR, lots of uh, departments and, and, and people should be involved in the decision making process. Um, talk to the training providers. You know, there's there's lots of advice around this topic. It's it's a huge topic at the moment, and there's 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 lots of information available online, tech partnership, government website. Um, again, it's the classic training needs analysis. Um, are there any vacancies you have open? Can these be repurposed for apprentices? Um, are you already delivering training? Can you repurpose that training and moving into apprentices? You know, do you have a graduate recruitment program that now you can repurpose into an apprenticeship program? Um, and again, as I said, existing employees can also go on apprenticeship programs. The point here is 
apprenticeships still have a stigma, you know, for those of you that are, remember Harry Enfield, you know, it's Kevin the teenager and I've got a lot of work to do with an apprentice. It, it's not that. Apprentices are people, you know, and the apprentice is just a badge, a badge that helps, um, you know, people understand that it's skills and work together mixed with government funding. Um, and you have to sell the, the positives, all of the benefits, the productivity, the skills, growth, etc. And that's, that's what makes you know, a successful apprenticeship. And then choose a provider and start recruiting. Again, quality providers, agree the terms, agree the programs, and ultimately it all starts with a vacancy if you're recruiting. But even if you're not recruiting internally, you still need that job description and a vacancy. And when, when um, hiring apprentices, make sure you, you treat them as you would a normal hire. You know, I've seen many employers in the past treat apprentices as, as a second grade uh, recruitment process when ultimately they're even more, it's even more important that you have a solid and thorough recruitment process because um, they are junior members with the, do not have skills. So you need to make sure they want to be in IT, they want to be in cybersecurity um, and that they're not just doing it for a job. Um, you need to make sure that all your stakeholders within your organisation are part of that process, the mentors, the people they'll be working with, HR, whoever it is that will be dealing with the apprentice um, which should be part of the process and you really need to make sure that you're making you know, a good decision um, even though you may be hiring someone that's slightly cheaper than a you know, more senior person, you know, it's still important that you make that, that um, top grading uh, recruitment process work. So what um, helps sustain apprentices in a job? Well, again, a real job. So it's not a case of, hey, I've got a cybersecurity um, uh, job and then they end up on the help desk for two years. That's not the work, they'll leave. Um, it's a real job and with good pay and prospects. Ultimately, you can pay uh, an apprentice uh, apprenticeship minimum wage, which is approximately uh, seven, 8,000 pounds, but you wouldn't get away with it. As soon as they get the skills, uh, they're sitting next to people who are earning, you know, ten times what they're earning. Possibly, um, they'll realise that they can walk out tomorrow and get a better job, a better paid job. So you need to make it realistic. Pay apprentices good wages. We recommend at least two to two fifty pounds uh, a, a week uh, salaries, um, and also st stage the incentives. You know, keep the apprentices keen by allowing them. Uh, bonuses to progress throughout their term with you with a final maybe bonus on on achieving their apprenticeship planning very important part of the whole process you need to have a team to support the apprentices you need to know what you want to do with them you need to know what the projects are going to be for them to be able to succeed in their apprenticeship there's this 20 percent off the job learning um, concern that industry has. What that means is you need to make sure that they're not just doing a job five days a week, that within those five days they are actually learning and you can evidence that by projects they do. They're going to be constantly submitting um, portfolio of evidence to e-portfolio systems to make sure that they, you know that the government is, is paying for something that is real. You need to prove that through your training provider and the work they're doing. Make sure that if you're hiring multiple apprentices that you create you know, a network between them so they can share experience and they, and they feel part of a, you know, a system, as it were. Um, quality of engagement with the training provider. Again, you may have an incumbent training provider. That doesn't mean they're the best provider for apprenticeships. Apprenticeships are unique. They do need um, a level of quality and understanding. Um, and process to deliver properly. Otherwise, what happens is the government through Ofsted will come in one day and pull the plug and take away your funds and you'll have to probably reimburse the government and the employer will be liable. So what ultimately are the products? Well, there are three. Uh, the cybersecurity technologist and there's an option um, for the technologist which is called the analyst. I'll go into the standards in a second. The intrusion analyst and then there's a degree security analyst. They have maximum bands of £18,000, so this is effectively the funds available to drive um, the success of the apprenticeship with the training provider. Obviously you won't be able to see that, um, but this is a document. There are three documents. There's a standard, there is an occupational brief, and there's an assessment plan. The two to predominantly focus on are the standard and the assessment and the occupational brief. This gives you an idea, if you can see that, 
type of jobs we're talking about here. You know, these are all the jobs, all the individuals that are in this building today. This is the foundation of, you know, where they can go. These, this could be the job, but obviously they're junior, and the skills that they're going to be learning will lead to these, these, these roles that you all should know. Um, within the standard, it talks about knowledge modules. Uh, knowledge modules are ultimately the, date, the, date, the detail, detail behind the learning and the experience that the employer is expected to give the apprentice and the training provider is supposed to teach the apprentice so that when they finish their apprenticeship at the end of that journey they're going to be tested to make sure they know what you know um, cryptography is or security um, case development is etc this is the high level and then the occupational brief another document um, in the annex it goes into a lot more detail just a couple examples here so knowledge module two, network and digital communications, and then goes into the plethora of detail, you know, understanding TCP IP, networking, etc. Point I've made here is that apprenticeships aren't always about getting someone green. You can get people in your workforce that may have technical experience that aren't cybersecurity people, and you want to put them into cybersecurity. And if that's the case, then what you do is you go through these standards, work with your pr provider, and you work out how many of these nodules modules you need and if you only need say three of them the program still needs to have some sort of length being more than 12 months but you'll have a reduced funding to, and you'll be able to still put them on apprenticeship programs to deliver some of the cybersecurity skills maybe not some of the basic skills so this is where it's a really flexible program um, that, that, that uh, works well again the cryptography one um, as you can see there, just goes into a little bit more detail about some of the um, specifics. And this is where training providers build their content, and this is where uh, employers need to make sure they have projects and they have um, roles in organisations where they're actually going to be doing this work. And then finally, the endpoint assessment. That is a synoptic test. So in the workplace, they'll be asked to do a timed test of some sort, uh, scenario-based um, where they'll be, you know, possibly, you know, designing a secure environment, etc. They'll submit that. Um, it, it's it's you, it's a five. It should, at the moment, for cybersecurity, it's not um, it's not 100% finished, but um, it's a three to five day uh, time frame where they submit it. Um, during their program, during their, their their 24 months, they are constantly submitting projects, and this is then used as a portfolio of evidence so that that is also assessed by an SME, an endpoint assessment um, in, um, individual. They are interviewed by the SME, so uh, I don't know if, if you were here earlier, the, the BCS were talking about um, endpoint assessors, you know, and trying to sort of join their team. The, these SMEs are going to be interviewing and, and looking at this material, and then an employer reference. So that was a very whistle-stop uh, tour of apprenticeships. Um, if you're a levy payer, that's the link, estimate my apprenticeship funding.sfa.beers.gov.uk. That tells you what your, 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 your uh, levy is um, if you're a levy payer. Um, and if you're not a levy payer, then it's very simple. You, you pick a program, you pick the standard, and then you pay 10%, the government pays the rest. Thank you. Any questions? Are there any targets that have been set in terms of the number of apprentices that the government is looking to appoint over a future yes. period? Yeah. Yes, uh, um, three million apprentices by 2000 something. I mean, it's, it's all irrelevant ultimately because it, the, 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 the scope of apprenticeships are huge. So from A to Z, you know, as I said, poultry farmer to... So Ultimately, the target is somewhat unreal. It's, 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 it's a target that covers so many industries that you could be using a 500 pound um, standard and to, to tick the box that it's the you know, th three millionth apprentice, whatever, but ultimately it's um, a 2,000 pound or 500 pound apprenticeship program. For digital industries, there's no particular target. Um, it's it is this very high level, 3 million by 2010, I think. I can't remember the exact number. Thank you. 
So there's no uh, particular breakdown into cybersecurity or no. information security? No, no. And this is why it's a bit of a misnomer because, you know, you could it could be any industry, it could be any price point, you know, that it's just a big number that they, they wanted to obviously to promote. Okay, and finally, in terms of cybersecurity, are there any estimates in terms of the number of opportunities for apprentices or in the scale of the requirement for a, a, apprentices? Is, it, is there any way in which the industry can get a handle on, because it was said earlier on, in, in terms of justifying the need, do we, do we need some sort of metrics as to, to how big the requirement of the demand is? Do we, do we know how many, in security, how many apprentices we would like to see in, in situ? No. There's no direct correlation to you know ongoing requirements compared to the market demand. You know what what is clearly obvious is that you know there there just aren't enough resources available for any digital standard, not alone cybersecurity. And so, you know, even if it took us the next ten years to build, you know, a, a cybersecurity apprenticeships or digital apprenticeships in, in particular, um, the, the the studies show that you know the the, the growth of computers of uh, computer requirements and digital skills requirements is still going to outstrip the supply so so there aren't any no there's no cor there's no direct correlation okay great well thank you very much to uh, thank you very much